Yes, hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening and watching. Uh, my name is Stephanie Meyer. I'm very happy that I'm uh, allowed to talk to you about feminist theorizing, about activism, academia and back again. That's the title of the input I'm going to give. Yeah, thanks a lot to the organizers, of course. Um, I hope what I have to present to you will be interesting for you. Um, you see here my name, my email address, so if you want to write to me, you are absolutely welcome. And of course, I'm very much looking forward to the debate we are going to have online later on. Um, first, I want to give you a kind of roadmap of what to expect from this input. I develop my thoughts in three parts, each is something between 10 and 15 minutes of input. And I hope that you will find a few minutes provided in between useful for reflection and to develop your own questions and comments on my thoughts. Um, in the first part, I try to demonstrate rather than talk about, I try to demonstrate one of the key concepts or what I believe to be one of the really key concepts of feminist epistemology, which is the idea of situating your research, situating your thoughts. I borrowed a term coined by Donna Haraway here, but of course she's by far not the only one whose work was important in teaching me what it means to situate oneself. And starting from this viewpoint, I try to establish then in the second part um, my views on the academization of feminist theory and feminist thinking that started in the 1980s. Um, here I broadly follow Sabine Haag's argument that institutionalization within the academia today is necessary to further develop feminist thought, but that we would be very naive to believe that this doesn't change the form and content of feminist thinking and feminist theory. And maybe even more importantly, also our understanding of what it means to do theory, to theorize. So to understand what's happening, I suggest to turn to Pierre Bourdieu's concept of social field and turn this lens on the academic field as such and on academic feminism in particular. So then it's time for the third part where I turn to activist feminism and activist theorizing. And I'm again viewing feminist activism through this lens of a social field. This is my tool to better understand it and specifically to understand the ways it differs from academic theory. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why so many of the older feminist debates that were situated very much at the border of the two fields do not lend themselves easily to academic reception. But at the same time, I think that this is exactly why we should be so interested in them, as they speak to both to our political needs and to feminist theory. So I believe that one of the possible dangers brought about by the institutionalization of gender studies within universities is the forgetting of more localized activist theorizing. And my example for this will be the very late reception within academic debates on intersectionality of many of the theoretical concepts, debates and insights of, for example, the migrant women's movements, Jewish feminists, black activists and other feminist groups that were developed in German speaking contexts during the early 1990s and already in the 1980s. And to be very clear here, my goal is not to criticize the concept of intersectionality or to say that we should stop using it. Um, but I want to point out that the strange forgetfulness about activist feminist debates on racism, on antisemitism and on other structures of dominance and on their interconnectedness is somewhat of a problem. And I want to ask what feminist academia could still learn if it looked more closely. So, this is going to be today's input. I'm looking forward to our discussion afterwards and to learn about what you think of these ideas. I will start now directly with this first part on academic feminist theory and feminist activist theorizing on my thoughts of this troubled relationship. So I think it's best to start by situating the following thoughts. And I try to take to heart one of the most important lessons of feminist theory which, among others, Donna Haraway has so beautifully phrased this idea that knowledge of any kind, including, of course, academic knowledge, is never just something out there waiting to be discovered, but quite to the contrary, knowledge is actively created, which is an activity that always happens somewhere in a concrete location. 
and which is undertaken by someone and more often than not by many someones working together. So these someones also to make the whole argument not necessarily always have to be humans, but that's not the part of the argument that I want to get into. So I'm trying to broadly situate the thoughts I want to present to you. I will not present you with a full list of people that I owe big thanks to that would get far too long, but I will just name a few that have been especially important to me. Um, first, there's of course a lot of other people's work that I needed to co-create these ideas. And as far as big names in academia go, um, there's among others the aforementioned Donna Haraway and the way she thinks about the production of knowledge. There's Pierre Bourdieu with his ideas on how to understand specific social fields. And there's Sabine Haag with her incredibly insightful study on the academization of feminism. These and of course other big names are where I borrowed a lot of the concepts and analytical tools which I used. But these tools would not work if they were not filled with life, so to speak, by so many others. Take, for example, Maïs, the Linz-based anti-racist migrant feminist organi organization who shows us how to really expertly balance between different social fields, academia, art and politics, for example. Take US American black feminists like, for example, Patricia Hill Collins, or take the black European and Afro-German researchers, writers and activists like, for example, Meayim, Peggy Pischer, Sharon Duda, Otto, who really show in their work what situating your thoughts actually means. Or take a look at the works of the Femigras, who among other things theorized about the possibility of turning the repressive marker migrant into a political identity and thereby into a tool of resistance and emancipation. And of course, there's many more without whom I could never have begun to work on the issues I'm talking about today. So this was a very first glimpse into why I prefer to think of a co-construction of knowledge rather than of knowledge as an individual property. But I promise to situate my thoughts and provide you with this glimpse of what they're built on in terms of other people's work is just one part of it. And it is, of course, the part that comes most easily to people working in academia. But second, there's still the person, the me, that talks to you. So we can start here with a number of social categories. I'm white, middle-aged, female, heterosexual, not visibly disabled. I'm an Austrian citizen from a provincial town. I completed a university degree. I have a not too precarious job. So cutting short this potentially endless list of adjectives that would always end with what Judith Butler called an embarrassed, etc. Um, I'm privileged with regards to many of the powerful differences that structure our societies. But for the development of the thoughts that I'm talking about today, another factor I think is even more important. And that is the story of how I came closer to feminism. And of course, I'm borrowing from bell hooks here. And even though it's just an individual story, I have reasons to think it's quite typical for quite a lot of feminists of my generation and maybe also of some younger ones. To start with, I started university in Vienna in 1997 and I was most interested in what was going on in the feminist lectures that there were and in the debates that feminist teachers were guiding us to. At that time, queer theory, deconstruction, postmodernity were the buzzwords at the time and place. So yes, Vienna was always a bit late. Um, if you just look at the extremes of these debates, it seems very simple. Some were excited by these new ways of thinking and of the political options this could offer, and others were afraid that the deconstruction of women might be the end of feminism. But as always, reality was, of course, a lot more messy and less simplistic. Positions were far more complex and not always that fixed. And as people did learn, they also changed, which is what happened to me quite a lot. So in terms of situating today's lecture, this, the important part, I think, is that I came closer to feminism in what me, this small town girl, viewed as a very lively academic setup that had been provoked to respond to new ideas and quite revolutionary new ideas just a few years before. At least equally important is that this was the pre-Bologna Bologna University, which, when I compare it to today's situation, offered a lot more freedom. For one, the social situation of students had only started to turn worse than. 
For example, as an Austrian citizen, you could still get so-called Familienbeihilfe until the age of 27 with hardly any questions asked, which of course reduced the time needed to spend to earn a living for many students. And in most disciplines, there was still a relatively high degree of choice as to which courses to take, including also courses from other disciplines and in which order. One of the downsides, okay, uh, of course, so this was not a completely rosy picture, quite to the contrary, was of course the digitalization was also only starting. For example, you'd get a handwritten certificate for each course that you took and this certificate was deposited in a box at the institute in question. But of course, you never knew in advance when the certificate would be ready. So it better check regularly because if it had gotten lost, it would take months to receive a copy. For every book or journal you want, you need it, you went to the library at least twice. First to order it, then to check if it was there. And most of the time you did the whole thing over again some weeks later because it had been on loan and there was no way to make a reservation or know beforehand when the book would be back. So even to myself, this sounds quite absurd uh, when I look back, but yeah, it was completely normal then. This also meant that you spent a lot of time at or around the university. And it further meant that you also had time to read quite a lot and time to meet people from your own and other courses. And you could spend time on discussions and sometimes you would even discuss academic issues, including academic feminism. So um, this was actually the route that I came closer to feminism. I had been a political activist before, but I had never had much of a focus on feminist issues besides and above this rather intuitive wish to be treated equally. I believe that the fact that I learned about feminism first in academia rather than, for example, through the tales of feminist comrades in activist groups is important for my perception of the acti activist and the academic field um, as two fields that I view as connected, but also as quite different. So this was a first attempt at situating my thoughts in terms of feminist theorizing and thereby trying to put an aspect of what I learned into practice, the academic practice of holding a lecture, but practice nevertheless. So now I would ask you to take a short break, take a piece of paper and a pen now and take two minutes to reflect on these first thoughts. Try to use the technique of Schreibdenken, I'm sorry, I don't know the English word for that, of writing your thoughts down immediately in whatever order or whatever way they come to mind. Just start writing at the beginning of the two minutes and don't stop until they are finished. The text is of course for your eyes only, unless you decide to share some of your thoughts in the debate later on. Um, please start with the sentence, for me, situating myself means, and continue, or if you prefer to write in German, which is perfectly fine, please start with, mich zu verorten bedeutet für mich. Yeah, take your two minutes, take your time, we'll see you soon.
Yeah, welcome back. So, I've been talking for quite some time now about how I came to see activist and academic feminism. Now let's turn to the question of what I actually mean by these terms. Um, I start from Pierre Bourdieu's analytic term, social field. He, what is this? He understands social fields to be relatively autonomous social microcosms. That is to say, they are parts of the all-encompassing social space where specific rule supplies, specific currencies or specific capital is valued and specific goals are deemed all important. Goals, he also calls this illusio, that's what's, what drives the players in this social field. Academia is one prominent example of a social field, besides, for example, religion, the arts, institutional politics and so on. Academia, of course, of course got loads of specific rules. I'm just naming a few. I'm sure you can think of many others. Starting from the institutionalized ones, academia grants you a title after completing certain tasks from the BA and MA all the way up to professor. And in doing so, it doesn't matter if the task, let's say the thesis you completed, has any economic value or if it has any practical use for anyone. The only legitimate question within these academic rules to be posed are whether it advances the knowledge of the specified discipline and whether it does so by academic means. This means in a methodoli methodically sorry, sound fashion with proper references to all the work you built on and so forth. So the goal, the illusio as Bourdieu calls it, that drives the players of this game of academia and I'm talking about the most formal level here, we'll get into a bit more uh, deeper level soon, is the advancement of knowledge and not economic gain as it would, ex for example, be the case in the economic field. Importantly, this does not mean that actors in the academic field don't have other goals as well. Power, economic gains, for example, are very important ones. A feeling of personal importance or fulfilling dreams or even of helping other people might well be others. But, and this is the important point, point, these are not specific to the academic field. For example, money and power are important currencies in whichever part of the social, social space within capitalism you look, but they are not specific to academia and I'm really talking about the specificities here. The currency, the capital, which is specific for the academic field is academic prestige. For example, the accomplishment of widely read and highly regarded publications, which today is quantified and measured in a, as I think, very problematic fashion in terms of citations. Prestige also takes the form of invitations to speak at high-end conferences, um, invitations to be an advisor at an academic journal or a self-governing academic body, or it takes the form of other researchers wanting to collaborate with you. Academic prestige, as you have probably already guessed, is inherently a slow building currency and therefore prone to stabilizing existing power structures. Simply put, quite often those that own a lot of it in their roles as conveners of conferences, editors of journals and as those responsible for hiring young colleagues decide who else this currency is awarded to. I guess I don't even need to point out that this system very much works in favor of conserving privileges. This holds true in terms of white privilege and male privilege, as well as social privilege, which more often than not, of course, are intertwined, these different types of privileges. In the last two decades, project funding already received became an important and purely monetary measurement of academic prestige, which in my opinion only worsened these conservative tendencies. The bad news, I think, is that this already starts early in researchers' careers and the effects are stronger the further up the ladder you look. To have even a slight chance of receiving money for your PhD studies, you'd better put a lot of time and effort, and I'm talking about a lot of a lot of time here, into your proposal. Having some English native speaker polishing your text definitely helps. So quite often time and money can be at least as important as having this really bright idea and these really important questions that would be worth researching. Once you got your PhD, the question of your CV, your curriculum vitae, becomes a lot more pressing. Experience abroad more and more turns in, into a conditio sine qua non. So you better don't have children or old people you need to take care of and cannot easily move. And that's not even taking into account that not everyone wants to uproot his or her life for a job. 
So this is a first hint at what I believe to be the problems of the neoliberalization of academia. And I hope that later on in the discussion, we also get the chance to talk about what these developments do to universities as spaces of learning. Academic feminism is, of course, part of the academic social field. So in principle, all the rules, the currency, the illusio that characterizes the academic field as such also hold for academic feminism. But there are some specifics as well. Academic feminism is still close, both in terms of the issues it debates, as well as in terms of personal connections to the political movements that it was generated by, or which in turn have partly been inspired by academic debates. I say partly here because I believe that while, for example, a queer movement in Austria, which explicitly uses this label, would quite probably not exist without academic queer theory and queer studies, the political questions and the needs that these movements address have by no means been invented by academia. It follows that academic feminism still has a political goal and many of its practitioners do not only want to produce knowledge, but very consciously ask what knowledge they are producing, by what means and who they are producing it for. The still quite weak, often precarious and provisional institutionalization of academic feminism, either in the form of gender studies programs or in the form of feminist tracks within established disciplines, also might make it a bit easier to bend some of the academic rules. On top of that, academic feminism is inherently and necessarily interdisciplinary in character, which also makes it a bit unruly, so to speak. There is just no such thing as the one leading journal that has been around forever and can claim relevance for all feminist research. And attending an academic feminist conference, you might find yourself more often than not eagerly debating conference formats, the role of speakers and spectators and so on, which is quite unheard of in other settings. As I said before, still academic feminism is part of the academic field. Engaged feminist research, st research still needs to either follow standards for good academic practices, needs to adhere to theoretical and methodological reflection and use its research methods in accordance with the discipline it contributes to, or it needs to take a stand and start theoretical, methodological and methodical debates in order to change current standards. If it didn't do that, it could not expect to be accepted as a part of the academic field. And let me make a brief note on the side here. I'm very well aware that there are a lot of actors both within and outside university that do not accept feminist research as an academic in their at all. Even though they sometimes use seemingly academic arguments, these are always easily dismantled. For example, their most common one, which is feminism negates biology, should they ever find the time to read up a little bit on what biological research today says about the biology of sex, they'd be truly shocked. In my opinion, what we find here is a purely political and ideological resistance to academic feminism, partly because academic feminism has not only an academic but also political goals, but mainly because anti-feminism is a political movement concerned with safeguarding male privileges and universities, of course, are especially full of those. So, being part of the academic field and now these uh, kind of quarrels about academic feminism as such aside, of course this means that academic feminism also needs to take some responsibility for what is happening there and even more to the point take responsibility for its own role in current processes of the neoliberalization of universities. I think it's not enough to be critical with regards to the contents of your research and your courses and so on, although that's of course important and necessary, but feminist academia also needs to be critical with regard to its institutional role. For example, today nearly every grant program includes the requirements of a paragraph on gender to be included in all applications. This is good in some ways, because by making it harder to get funding for all male research teams, it might provide an incentive to hire female researchers and it gives a certain value to be measured in grant money to gender expertise as a bonus for the application. But it can also be bad. More often than not, this is an exercise of ticking boxes, seen to be superfluous and bothersome and not connected to the outcome of the project at all. 
If institutions have few female experts, like many technical universities do, it can lead to these experts being coaxed to lend their name to each and any project, no matter if it has any relevance for their own research. And last but not least, it reinforces rather than breaks the logic of grant money as the new all-important currency in academia. Another example, and for me that is even closer to home as I work at the Fachhochschule University of Applied Sciences, uh, the growing calls for gender knowledge as well as other critical knowledge to be readily applicable to management programs and projects. Gender mainstreaming strategies, diversity management manuals, trainings for everything from argumentation to dismantling of stereotypes, these are things that are in demand. Again, there's absolutely nothing inherently bad about any of these things. For example, training how to be more brave when you witness discrimination, or help to develop structures that strengthen employees who have to fight for equal treatment are definitely positive things. But again, the line between credible efforts and ticking the boxes exercises is a fine one and not always easily determined. And even well-intentioned measures, measures can often become a way to carefully avoid addressing the really pressing issues, like for example, racism. And there's lots and lots of examples for this with um, diversity management manuals and stuff like this that don't even mention the word racism on all of their pages. Okay, to sum it up so far, I've now tried to introduce the concept of social field, explain it with the example of academic of the academic field and then turn to academic feminism as one, even if often uneasy, part of this field, which therefore cannot claim to be free of its many problematic aspects. In my last examples, I try to highlight how academic feminism is playing an active part in current neoliberal transformations of universities, despite its often very critical stance on this issue. So, having talked a lot about academia, let's take another short break and then move on to feminist activism and activist theorizing, and especially to theorizing at the border of academia and activism. I would again ask you to please take two minutes um, to note your impressions and thoughts, explore examples that resonate with you, or, of course, formulate your criticism. Again, please write whatever comes to mind. The beginning of your se first sentence now should be, when I think about feminism and university, or in German, wenn ich an Feminismus und Universität denke. Yeah, two minutes and I'll see you again. So, welcome back again. Um, yeah, recalling the definition of a social field with Pierre Badieu, its main characteristic, as 
we have just talked about uh, the specific goal or illusio, the specific rules and the specific currency or capital that is valued within the social field. And I will now try to look at feminist activism through this conceptual lens. If we do that, it appears to be part of the broader field of social and political movements. It shares their belief in the possibility to change the world from below through coordinated but non-hierarchical and non-institutionalized activities of many people. Among its specific rules that very clearly mark the difference to institutionalized politics are that grassroots democracy on a strict voluntary basis is its kind of baseline, it's what it's really built on. Uh, other, other things are decentralization, the high reliance on unpaid work and spontaneous action, and I think one of the most important points, it's collective character. It follows that trust and solidarity are currencies that are highly valued within this specific social field. Seen from this perspective, the differences to the academic field are startling. The topic of gender relations and constructions of sex and gender is of course similar, but everything else seems quite different. Formal institutionalized positions with a clear hierarchy on the one hand side versus a grassroots approach on the other. Formal qualifications as the basic necess necessity for entering the field versus the wish to reach out as far as possible. Turning now more specifically to the production of knowledge, we also see big differences. Looking at the rules first, we see on the one hand side rules of citation and a focus on individual authorship and on the other side, the collective production of knowledge with authors more often than not consciously kept anonymous. Maybe even more importantly, also the goals of knowledge production are not the same. Academic knowledge is still first and foremost self-serving. It's good if it's new, if it broadens the discipline's horizon and if, it's, and if it was gained following academic principles. Um, I have to say that what I'm saying here about academia is probably very strongly influenced by my own uh, home in social sciences, but I think it holds for quite a number of other fields too. It is not important for academia, but its knowledge can immediately solve any real-world problems. And I would even argue that this should not be the case. Academic methods and procedures are not at their best when they are required to produce directly applicable solutions but when they have the time and the intellectual freedom to study a problem from all possible angles. Activist knowledge production, on the other hand, mostly does not follow strict methods of data collection and analysis, but often starts from personal experiences and values these as a source of information and insight. It's rarely got one clearly defined author, but rather it evolves as a collective of people develops. And activists also hardly ever search knowledge as a goal in itself, but as a means to do something. This can, of course, be a very wide range of things, this something that needs to be done. It might be to be better able to analyze a problem, understand it and develop strategies. It might be to be better able to react faster or target your responses better, to know more about possible tools and technologies that can be used for protest, to be able to understand yourself and your own situation in this society better. And this last point was always especially pronounced in feminist activism, starting from the early consciousness raising groups where um, at that time mainly white women tried to understand their position and break free from stereotypical roles and behaviors as women, to black and migrant feminist groups that starting from, started from their own experiences and analyzed the interlocking systems of sexism, racism and classism, uh, for example, the Combahee River Collective is probably the most famous one here, um, to debates on privilege and whiteness or the white savior complex that have become more and more important in recent years. In contrast, academic practices traditionally, I know this doesn't hold true for all fields, but traditionally try to exclude the individual, the researcher as a, poor, as a person as much as possible. So we see, I think, a lot of differences. And I think it's easy to imagine that these two social fields don't always find it easy to communicate. But I also believe that it would be highly important that they do. I think I have to be more precise here. I have the impression that as many feminist activists are also academics, the transfer of academic ideas to the world of activism is happening quite a lot. 
It's often difficult and it comes with a huge set of problems of its own. Biggest among them, I think, is the classism that it often entails when feminism gets academicized. But I believe that exchange in this direction is happening quite a lot. So specifically, I think that academic feminism needs to be much more alert to what is happening in activist context, not only as a subject that one can study, but as a source of knowledge that can lead one to rethink one's own theoretical beliefs, among other things. So let's start and let's take a look at our example, which are the debates happening in the 1980s and especially the early 1990s in German speaking contexts context and it dealt with racism, antisemitism and ableism. Mainly it was these three axes of discrimination that were discussed then um, and which included the structures of disc discrimination and privilege within the women's movements. Again, I can only highlight a few of very many important developments, but I hope it will be enough to provide you with kind of a sketch of the situation. So in 1984 and 85, uh, the US American black feminist writer Audre Lorde came to Berlin as a guest lecturer and her visit became an important seed for the development of an Afro-German women's movement, which early included among many other activists, Mea Yim and Katharina Ogontoye, who uh, were also among the editors and writers of the 1986 book Farbe Bekennen, or the German, uh, the, sorry, the English translation, uh, uh, Showing Our Colors. And shortly thereafter, ADEFRA, the organization of Afro-German feminists, was founded. In 2012, Peggy Piesche uh, published Euer Schweigen schützt euch nicht, um, which is a great source of information on the black women's movement. I don't think the book has been translated to English, and I'm sorry, this is true for quite a lot of the material I'm presenting here. Most of it is only available in German. Um, this movement, this black women's movement, again and again challenged the simplified notion of women by pointing out that while the term was used as if it was universal, in reality it was modeled on a very particular group of white women whose very particular experiences were taken to be the norm for all women. Also in 1984, the Congress Sind wir uns denn so fremd? I translated this uh, as are we that strange to one another, I'm not sure if the translation is very good, um, took place. Um, a congress which aimed to get migrant women and German women or Ausländische und Deutsche Frauen uh, to talk to each other. The documentation of this congress shows mainly that white German activists found it very difficult to talk when they were confronted with criticism by migrant activists. But if this congress was one where rather little was said, the situation had changed uh, quite a lot uh, by 1990 at another congress in Cologne, um, which, uh, where, the, where tensions really broke out. Racism, ignorance uh, and the failure to confront their own privileges by white activists were the most important points of criticism that were voiced there by activists of uh, the black and the migrant feminist movements. Um, there is also a publication, but it's um, it's kind of a brochure, uh, as all the other material is available at Stichwort, at the Archiv of the Frauen- and Lesbenbewegung in Werner. So if you want to take a look, I didn't have the ori original, so I just brought you some of the chapter um, headlines. Um, yeah, so these debates, they are nearly broke up the Congress and led to it being deemed a failure by most participants. So therefore, Partly, therefore, but you know, this was kind of the last straw I, I, I can imagine. Uh, in the following years, there were conferences for, at that time, the invitation politics was refugee women, immigrants, black German and Jewish women, um, in order to provide a space for discussion and possible alliances of feminists that were not part of the dominant society. And what I, the picture I put here is from uh, 2013, the FEMOCO, the Feminism of Color Conference, added to this, transition, to, uh, to this tradition. These alliances between uh, migrant feminists, black feminists, Jewish feminists and uh, others that were not part of the dominant society always proved to be quite uneasy as well. There, this one never easy alliances. 
There were, for example, debates whether black as a political category, an overarching category that was not related to skin color, could really serve as an overarching political identity. And some groups like the Femigras in their um, very, very uh, good text, uh, Via die Seiltänzerinnen, uh, for example, said no to that and proposed their own idea of migrant as a political identity. Migrant, um, the idea was to take this category of migrant that was so much connected to the state, to repression, to exclusion, and turn it into a political identity, into an identity that's linked to certain experiences and that could be a tool for resistance. So that was their kind of their, their main argument why they wanted to have this specific political identity. Other debates ranged about similarities and differences, for example, between racism and anti-Semitism. Um, the question at that time, I'm talking again about the uh, 1990s, uh, was often put in the form of whether Jewish women were white. Um, but behind them might be a bit clumsy phrasing. There are, of course, very important questions about the differences between differences. Another kind of angle is presented by books like this one, Entfernte Verbindungen, Distant Connections, um, from 1993. Um, this book, on the one hand, tried to trace differences, but also possibilities for alliances, including also white activists, both as authors, as well as uh, in their reflections as such. And to give a specifically Austrian example as well, in 1994, the conference Racism and Feminisms, among other things, brought international speakers, uh, high-ranking speakers like Patricia Hill Collins, Afta Bra, Ruth Frankenberg, for example, to Vienna. But, and that's maybe even more, more important and more interesting, the conference itself also became a contested issue, as the academic format with speakers and a listening public uh, drew heavy criticism by some activists who wanted uh, more participatory ways of knowledge production, but who in turn expressed their criticism in a highly problematic fashion that drew on black and white uh, symbolism on this symbolism of colors, which in turn then became another focus of criticism. So this quite, there was quite a debate going on. Also during the 1980s, feminist historians and activists had engaged in debates about the roles and agency of German women during National Socialism that broke with the former and all too easy idea of women just being victims of an extremely patriarchal society. And uh, the, of course, the important thing again is all women being victims, um, which kind of for quite some time was somewhat of the, the mainstream of feminist thought, but which was challenged then in the 1980s. Um, for Austria, of course, the debate on Weitheim, uh, the election of Kurt Weitheim, and then 1988, the Remembrance Year, were important here. Okay, to cut it short. Um, a lot of things were happening during the 1980s and 1990s that forced the predominantly white women's movements also in German-speaking context, to rethink many of their ideas, including, among others, their analytical tools. Most of all, the one-dimensional focus on patriarchy and also their relation to ethnicity and nationality, which could not be resolved by simply stating that, as a woman, I have no country, um, because you still held your European or Austrian or German passport. Activists then had to start to get to terms with the fact that any analysis that only focused on gender relations without understanding that gender is always already mediated by other structures of dominance was just not enough. And as always, it was easy to agree on this interconnectedness of different aspects of systems of power in principle, but it was much harder to put these thoughts into political practice. This can, for example, be seen with regard to the debates about foreign men and the question whether racism against men had to be a feminist issue. And um, of course, it has to be. The, I think that's that's very clear today. But if you think about uh, the ethnicization of sexism that we have to uh, view in recent years, we see that these older debates and the arguments made then are still relevant for us today. Even more difficult for many fat feminists was to understand that they could not think of themselves as women in the sense of that generic woman 
in contrast, for example, to migrant or black women who were seen as different as other women, as special. Um, so the black and migrant women's movements, of course, kept voicing that criticism from the beginning, but the attempts by white activists to grasp that issue showed that it was quite difficult for them to really follow through and to understand that they, their experiences were just as special, were just as non-representative, non-universal as everybody else's. Yeah, even though I could not get into any details, I hope I could show that a look at these debates could really enrich academic feminist debates, especially debates on intersectionality and critical whiteness, I think. And I hope that we can get deeper into these theoretical insights during our discussion. To finish now, I would like to point to another lesson for academic feminism that goes beyond the content of our theories. The lesson we might draw for the organization of our work for the practices we engage in when we produce feminist knowledge. This starts from the practices each individual controls, like what to read and who to quote in a paper. It should also make us think about which types of knowledge we engage with in our research and also in which way. It is easy, it is always easy to show that social movements fall short when measured through the perspective of our most advanced theories on racism or gender relations or basically pick your topic, it doesn't really matter. But is that really the way we are going to learn the most? This is the question I would always pose. So I'd suggest to rather take activist theorizing serious, rather ask for what can be learned from there. And um, to do that, I think we need to be aware of the different sets of rules at play in these two different fields. The two different fields, academia and activism, I think are not better or worse one than the other, but they are different and just treating them as if they were the same, in my opinion, is detrimental to both. Probably most important, of course, um, but also the most difficult, would be to start changing the institutional rules of university. The rules of hiring people, the rules or the ways of measuring academic achievements, and last but not least, the possibility to combine academic work with a life that's not ruled by permanent stress, precarity, fear, and the need to be endlessly flexible. That would make everybody's lives better, but it could also be a first step towards a more equal and less exclusively white academia. So, that was it for the lecture. I'm really looking forward to getting to know your thoughts in our discussion later on. I'd like to ask you to take once more two minutes to reflect on the last part of the input. You know that will. Please write for two minutes without pausing, without censoring your thoughts. Your first sentence now should be feminism needs or in German feminismus braucht. See you soon.
Okay, yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks for staying with me. Hope to see you at our discussion. And of course, I'm also happy to receive questions and comments at my email address, stephanie.meyer at fhcampusweden.at. Thanks a lot and see you. Bye.